So task agnostic continual RL is the subject of the day. And uh, basically today I'm going to talk about a really simple baseline in task agnostic continual RL and how awesome it is, okay? So I'm not here to sell a fancy new method. So here's the TLDR. Um, if you're like me, you've been uh, interested in continual learning for a while and you've been mainly working on this like incremental image classification problem. But uh, again, if you're like me, your motivation goes much uh, more, much beyond that. Your motivation might be uh, to eventually deploy like little agents that would roam in the world and accumulate knowledge autonomously until you know they reach uh, general intelligence. Um, so that's kind of my motivation for doing continual learning. And then um, today, what I'm going to talk about is if you align with this use case of uh, deploying these uh, agents in the world that learn autonomously, um, then the 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 the, 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 the the upper bounds that we use in continual learning. So this idea of like um, using the, training your algorithm on stationary data and seeing uh, how, and comparing it to your continual learning method to understand how much forgetting there is in a benchmark. Um, so that's upper bound. And the other upper bound of making uh, your method task aware, if it's task agnostic, uh, these upper bounds, well, we're not, we're, we're reaching them, them and we're even overcoming them in this um, scenario of task agnostic continual reinforcement learning, which I will explain next. So if you come from the, the field of continual supervised learning, then I, I think the conclusions or actually, or at least the observations uh, that I'm, we're going to make can be quite surprising, okay? Um, so hopefully that's clearer uh, at the end of the talk, but uh, basically what I will do is I'll do a quick uh, background on continual learning, then I'll jump, uh, I'll do a quick uh, review of reinforcement learning, then I'll try to explain the setting of task agnostic continual RL, then we'll talk about the bounds I, I, I tried to explain in the TLDR, and then we'll talk about the methods and uh, the findings, and that's pretty much it, okay? Um, so continual learning, I, I'm guessing everyone here knows a lot about continual learning. Maybe I can skip this slide. Um, yeah, I'm seeing some, yeah. Most of us do, but I don't know if everyone ah, does, okay. but I think most of us do, yeah. Okay, okay, so basically uh, continual learning is about accumulating knowledge on non-stationary data distributions, and um, sadly, our deep machine learning methods or continual learning methods, um, they tend to forget when we train them on non-stationary data distribution, as shown in this little example. We call this big drop in performance when the task changes or the data distribution changes, uh, catastrophic forgetting. And even though uh, at least for me, the, the motivation for doing continual learning is uh, this idea of learning new tasks faster and better. Uh, right now, the field mostly studies the phenomenon of catastrophic forgetting and trying to solve it. So how can we make uh, our algorithms remember, basically? This seems like a somewhat limiting definition of continual learning uh, to me. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's, you know, you, it, in many cases, if you think about lifelong learning of an agent in the world or something, it's not necessarily that the the uh, the statistics are non-stationary. It's more like you've only sampled a small part of the world, and then you can continually get exposed to more and more of the world. But then mm -hmm. when you go back to where you had sampled before, the distribution hasn't changed. It's still the same. You just don't want to forget it, mm -hmm. right? So it's not clear that it has to be limited to non-stationary. In fact, I would argue most of the time it's, it is stationary. It's just, you've only sampled a small piece of it. I don't know, uh, maybe, that, maybe that's more of a philosophical oh, question. Well, that's, uh, 
that's interesting. So, but wait, if you yeah, think about like a, yeah, learning to ride a bike, you know, you yeah. learn to ride a bike and then you later learn to ride a car. But then when yeah. you go back to the bike, it's still the same distribution. It's the same task. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Right. So what, what I'm saying is, uh, but in your example, the data distribution is changing. It's, it's, it's going from a data distribution for, of riding a bike to the data distribution of riding a car and then back to the- And then back to, but the world that you're sampling from, the statistics of that world has not changed. The statistics, yes. So it's- You yeah, just I, happen I, to choose actions now that lead yes. you to a different state space in the world. Yeah, yeah, of course. So in some sense, there is non-stationarity in the part of the world that you're observing. Okay, because maybe, maybe that's maybe more of a definitional. Okay. Uh, but I think we have the uh, exact same motivation yeah, 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 in yeah. the back of our mind. Yeah, yeah. And which is super aligned with uh, this work of uh, task agnostic. Yeah, exactly. Work, I think. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's why it. I bring it up. Yeah. Cool, cool. Um, okay, so continue learning. Then I guess what is the, um, how are people knowledgeable of, uh, reinforcement learning and like MDPs and PAMDPs. Uh, should I spend a lot of time on it or no time on it? You don't know? Okay, I'll just I'll assume um, assume you guys have never heard of the word MDP and PAMDP. Okay, so um, some background. We're going to talk about reinforcement learning now, uh, which is often um, formalized in uh, Markov decision processes or MDPs. Uh, so an MDP is this, uh, here it's unrolled. So it's this cute little thing where there is a state variable of the world um, and then an agent uh, here in blue is gonna take some actions which will throw him or it in a new state and will deliver a reward, okay? so. The name of the game in RL is to find a policy pi uh, or that um, maximizes the cumulative rewards that the agent uh, you know, accumulates in its life or in an episode. You know? So what is really important about MDPs is that uh, one, the state of the world is fully observable by the agent and two, the state of the world is also Markovian, okay? So basically we're assuming that the agent at every time step, its sensors is giving it all of the information it needs to take optimal action, okay? Now I'm gonna to try to explain uh, later why I think this is uh, too big of a constraint, but you know, right now uh, with MDPs, you can you know, do some cute things like, um, play uh, certain kinds of video games or play some board games, okay? But uh, I think for real life application, you need something that's much more general, which brings us uh, to the partially observable MDP, okay? So now um, here, the states of the world in gray is not observed uh, by the agent. The agent only observes um, observations that are called the uh, XT here. And um, yeah, so now the, we're not assuming that at any time step, the agent with its sensors can uh, get all of the information that is relevant to it um, to take optimal action, okay? So we're assuming, we're taking into account that much more is happening beyond our, our sensors, okay? And I think uh, if we're serious about, you know, um, the eventually deploying agents in the world that could learn uh, and accumulate knowledge, uh, we need to frame our thinking in POM DPs and not MDPs, right? Like right now I, I'm talking to you guys, but uh, so much is happening beyond my sensors. Uh, the, the stock market is changing and this has an effect on my portfolio. Uh, someone is reviewing my paper and I'll be uh, sad if it's uh, rejected later on. So uh, a lot is happening beyond our sensors. So I think PAMDPs is important. Now, 
where does task agnostic continual RL uh, come in? Oh yeah, sorry, I skipped something. Um, if you want to act optimally, uh, optimally in a PAMDP, um, you need to take into account all of the previous um, uh, observations and rewards. Okay, so this scales really poorly, obviously, um, but we will uh, shove this under the rug for now and come back to it uh, later. Okay. So uh, now, oh yeah, with uh, PAMDPs, now you can do uh, more interesting things like uh, maybe play uh, poker, uh, where the hidden state would be the cards that uh, your opponents have. Or uh, you can think about like more interesting robotics example. Uh, maybe uh, I want my robot to help me build a house where, so in this case, uh, my robot probably needs to keep inferring what the state of the house is and what other people are doing in order to, in order to uh, take optimal actions. Um, so yeah, now we can do much cooler things than before. Um, okay, so now I'll try to explain what task agnostic continual RL is uh, as a PAMDP uh, special case, okay? Um, so, it's going to look uh, bad at first, but uh, you'll understand later uh, where I'm trying to get to, okay? So the first thing we're gonna do is uh, instead of having a, a state of the world that is unobserved and an observation that is sampled from that state, uh, instead we're gonna reparameterize re re the MDP uh, the PAMDP, such that the state of the world is separated in two parts, an unobserved part, uh, so here it's uh, SH, and an observed part, okay? So I'm just uh, repar reparametrizing things. Uh, now the graph looks uh, more complicated, but essentially it's the same thing, okay? And now we can do things like uh, uh, point out what certain mechanisms are doing. For example, um, here, the uh, purple uh, arrows are basically representing the mechanism through which the hidden state is changing the dynamics of the world, okay? Whereas um, the orange line uh, represents how the hidden state changes um, the reward function of the agent, okay? So now we can talk about those. And um, yeah, now to, ex to further explain task agnostic continual RL, I like to come back to this stupid uh, running example, which is um, a robot learning to do massages, okay? And you'll understand later why it makes sense. So, um, the robot basically uh, has a distribution of two clients. One likes uh, rough massages or like therapeutic massages and one likes um, relaxing massages or soft massages, okay? And the agent needs to infer what the client likes, okay? So basically here, um, the hidden state would be the client's preferences, okay? Um, so, Basically, the first thing we're going to do is instead of having a possibly humongous hidden state, we're just going to assume that the hidden state is a single variable, okay, a single categorical variable. So this is really aligned uh, with uh, the running example. Uh, the hidden state is either I like it relaxing or I like it um, uh, therapeutic, okay? Uh, so basically now I'm trying to make uh, some assumptions to make um, the PUMDP uh, more easily manageable such that I can study this idea of like continually accumulating knowledge or uh, continually accumulating skills, which is uh, what we're ultimately in interested in in continual learning. So, okay, so now the hidden state is simpler. It's just a single categorical variable. 
And now I'm going to make another assumption. I'm going to assume that um, the hidden states or the task variable, it's non-stationary and more specific, specifically, it's locally stationary, okay? So basically um, in the PomDP, in theory, my the, the client's prefer preferences, they could change at each time step randomly. But in task agnostic continual RL, I'm gonna assume some you know, continuity in that task variable. I'm gonna assume that we're gonna spend a lot of time on a certain client preferences and then a uh, lot more time on a, a different client with another preferences. So I'm assuming uh, that this task variable is uh, non-stationary and locally uh, stationary. So this will help me study um, what we are interested in. Next, um, I'm going to assume that the agent cannot change the um, or has no effect on the hidden state of the world or uh, the task variable, because this is fundament fundamentally not important for the problem. So we're going to remove that link to make things simpler. Um, now, we're going to go back to this idea that the task variable, it can change the dynamics of the world but it can also change uh, the reward function uh, of the world, okay? In um, purple and in orange. Now, not, not now, uh, for now, the next step is just a personal choice. For me, um, it makes more sense, instead of studying both of these things and making things less tractable, I think we can just focus on a changing reward function um, I think it's much more important to the, 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 the fundamental problem we want to study. Um, so basically, um, in this work, we're just going to remove the, the link where the agent can change the physics of the world or change the dynamics of the world. And we're just going to focus on a task variable that can change the reward function. Okay. So I hope that this was somewhat clear. And um, so yeah, in the end, uh, our task agnostic continual RL uh, scenario looks like this. And um, because, so it's task agnostic in the sense that the agent needs to infer um, the task or the, the context here, and it's going to do so uh, via the observations and reward, okay? as we will see next. Yeah, that uh, was very clear. Thank you. Oh, wow. Great. Thank yeah. you very much. <laughs> um, so yeah, just a super quick uh, summary. Uh, we started with the PAMDP. Whoops. We assume non-stationary hidden states. We assume a passive non-stationarity. So the agent cannot change the hidden state of the world. We also assume that the hidden state is just a single variable, which we often call TAS ID, for better or for worse. Um, okay, so in task agnostic continual RL, just like in uh, task agnostic uh, supervised learning, you can compute a task awareness uh, soft upper bound by providing a task label to an agent. Okay, so in the if we go back here, if I provide the the task variable to the agent my problem just co collapse, collapses back to an MDP, okay? So uh, if I want to understand how much is lost by uh, having to infer my context or infer my task, then I can just feed the task label to my agent. And now I can you know, understand with the gap how much is lost. I can do a similar thing if I want to understand how much is lost due to forgetting, okay? So uh, if I have an algorithm in mind, uh, I can always run it on a stationary data distribution. Uh, and then by comparing its performance with the performance of the continual learning algorithm, I can understand how much is lost uh, in terms of forgetting, okay? So these two bounds are 
well established in um, continual supervised learning, and I think also in continual reinforcement learning. And it will be really important for uh, the experimental part of the presentation. Okay. And yeah, uh, this is just to show you like if something was not clear in the paper, we have like a little framework to think about all of the little uh, different RL scenarios that we talk about. Um, so if that's interesting to you, you can uh, check that table and according text. Um, okay, so methods. So, you know, I told you that um, the paper is about a simple baseline. So I'm going to get to uh, its explanation. So first, we need um, something to handle the partial observability of the problem, right? Uh, I don't know what the hidden state of the world is. Um, what I can do is I can condition on all the previous time steps of my life, but that, def that scales really poorly. So one kind of simple trick I can do is I can learn a variable that is going to represent um, the past time steps, okay? So here, um, ZT would represent whatever happened between uh, zero and T in terms of uh, uh, observation, you are an action. I guess I'm missing a little arrow here. Um, and uh, so basically you can think about ZT as a memory that the agent is going to uh, use to take its actions. And one simple way to instantiate this memory is with uh, a recurrent neural net or an, R an RNN, okay? So basically uh, to end all the partial observability of my problem, I'm just gonna mount an RNN to my favorite RL algorithm, okay? So that's, that's one part of the simple baseline that we're building. And then um, the other part is super simple. Um, I, need a, I need something to handle forgetting because I'm in a uh, continual learning scenario. So I'm going to do the simplest uh, continual learning uh, method. I'm going to use experience replay, okay, to, um, to, 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 not, to alleviate my forgetting. So in case you're not aware of that method, experience replay is super simple. I'm keeping, I'm gathering data in a buffer. And then when I learn a new task, I augment my mini batch with old data just to be sure I don't forget it. Okay. So uh, this takes care of or forgetting, but I'm paying a huge compute price, right? If I'm, um, if I'm learning 100 tasks and um, I want to keep my, I want to keep approximating a stationary data distribution in my mini batch. Well, I'm going to be spending like, 99% um, of my compute replaying old data and just 1% learning the new task. Uh, so experience replay works, but naively it uh, doesn't scale very well. Um, nevertheless, in this paper, um, the baseline we're gonna study is super simple. We take an RL algorithm, we add an RNN, we add experience replay, and then that's it. Okay, so we're just going to call this a uh, replay based recurrent RL. Um, and then in the paper, uh, in the experiment, I'm going to show you, uh, basically, we have kind of three strategies to create the baseline. So the simplest one is fine tuning and just going to the continual learning stream. And I don't care about forgetting, I'm just using all of my compute on the current task. I have experience replay that I just explained. And then I have uh, the multitask strategy. This one gets to train on all tasks simultaneously. And uh, so it doesn't incur forgetting. So that's my three strategies. And then for my task aware baselines, so the baseline that can observe the task ID, um, basically we'll, we can create two more baselines with the task uh, ID, uh, we can either use it to create a multi-ed algorithm. So um, this algorithm is super simple. It has 
the same uh, representation. Uh, it learns the same representation for all tasks, and then it enjoys one output head per task. And this uh, output head is basically going to choose uh, the proper action uh, for its task. Okay, so it's a really, really common uh, baseline um, to create task aware method. Uh, and, just a, a quick clarifying question. Yeah. How is, um, can you say what you mean by fine tuning again? And how is fine tuning not a task aware setting? So fine tuning um, is just, so, yeah, so I'm going to go through a sequence of tasks. And fine tuning just spends all of this compute uh, on the current task. Okay. Um, so it, Basically, it's the opposite of doing. It's like the is in contrast. Uh, experience replay is not going to spend all of its compute on the current task. It's going to spend spend some of its compute on past tasks, and then it's not necessarily task aware because it not necessarily sees a task ID, right? So it's like boundary aware, but not task ID it's, aware. It's uh, it's not boundary aware. Um, I mean, it kind of is because of the replay buffer, um, but uh, it's not doing anything special with the task boundary. So I can think uh, of that as a very strict kind of continual learning scenario where you just see one task only for a while, and then you only see the next task for a while, and you only see the third task and so on. Yeah. I see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that, that makes sense now. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Thanks uh, to the time. Um, okay, and then the other baseline is just uh, feed the task ID in the observation space and let the baseline figure out uh, how it wants to do things. Okay, um, now there is a backbone algorithm we use throughout all the experiments. It's called soft actor critic. Um, I'm going to try to explain it in like 30 seconds. Okay, um, so Basically, you start from Q learning, where um, you are learning uh, basically the, the value of a state action pairs in a table. And then the policy of the agent is implicit. At, a, at any state, you're just going to choose the action that is best uh, or that has the most value uh, in a particular state. Okay. So that's uh, super simple, but um, it doesn't scale very well if you have a large uh, state spaces, right? So uh, one thing we can do is we can approximate the values of the state or the Q value. The Q value. Uh, we can approximate it. And uh, what better way to approximate it is, um, yeah, we can approximate it with a neural net and that's what we call uh, DQN or deep Q learning, okay? And then again, um, the policy is implicit. I'm just going to choose uh, the best action given um, my, what my Q function is telling me at any step. But um, that doesn't work very, that doesn't work out of the box if your actions are continuous, right? If they are discrete, then it's kind of easy to choose the best uh, action in a state. But if uh, they are continuous, things get more complicated. So that's where, that's where soft actor critic comes in. In soft actor critic, now uh, my policy won't be implicit. I will actually parameterize uh, my policy and I will train it to maximize um the values of my q function okay so basically the policy is just learning about the world through the q value it's just learning uh, everything it is all of the information it knows bleeds in through the q value so it's kind of like a it looks a bit like a generative adversarial network where there's two neural nets and um the generator learns everything through the discriminator. So that's how I like uh, to think about SAT. Uh, but anyways, it's not super important for the conclusion of the paper, just, just
just uh, yeah, just now you know. Um, okay, so something that is super important for the experiment is the benchmark. Um, so I think that uh, previous work in task agnostic continual RL or just continual RL, um, they don't have the right benchmarks to align with uh, the use cases I've talked about uh, earlier. So either um, their task similarity is too high. So a lot of these continual RL papers, what they will do is uh, use uh, these little Mudroko tasks uh, to create uh, continual reinforcement learning environments. So for example, this could be like an ant that needs to move in different directions. And then the task would be uh, the particular direction that the ant needs to go to, okay? But for me, that, that that's really that's not an interesting continual reinforcement learning scenario. If you've learned to go in one direction, you can go in all directions, right? So uh, I think it's quite limiting and it's not aligned with our use cases. On the other end, a lot of work in continual RL has been on uh, Atari, so these little games. But now, in my opinion, the tasks are too dissimilar. So I don't think um, you can get much transfer by learning Pong and then learning how to play Mario, right? I think um, the tasks are too dissimilar. So it's not really interesting to study this idea of like forward transfer or uh, accumulating uh, knowledge that can be, you know, reused for faster learning later. So I think we need to study uh, continual RL uh, somewhere in between those things. And this is where um, meta world comes in or um, it's continual version, which they call continual world. So basically um, in meta world, it, Meta world is a suite of 50 manipulation tasks. And even though the tasks are uh, different, they all share a common reward structure, okay? So all tasks are combinations of uh, pushing, grasping, placing, reaching uh, components um, combined with uh, the objects of different sizes and connectivity. So um, some skill that is learned in task three can somehow be reused in task five, you know, and, and so on and so on. So for me, this is where uh, it makes the most sense to study continual RL. And um, all of the experiments will be done uh, in meta world. And uh, the disadvantage of meta world is it's super hard. <laughs> and it's super long to run, but um, yeah, now the experiments are done, so, the, so we're good. Um, okay, so first result. Um, so I've, I've run a, a lot of experiments in different uh, combinations of uh, meta world tasks. And one thing that always came up was that um, the task agnostic baseline that I've talked about earlier, this uh, recurrent replay-based RL algorithm. Uh, it was always performing better than all of the other methods, including the task aware one, okay? So here you can see like uh, by the gap here, that there's just constantly a gap between three RL and all of the baselines. And this is kind of super surprising. Yeah, first. that's really surprising. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So and that, that's why we're, that we'll, we'll try to get to the bottom of it, but I, I'm yeah. glad that you're surprised. Um, but yeah, this is really surprising because uh, you would think that the RNN, the best thing it can do is infer the task, which would bring it to the level of uh, the task aware baseline. But we'll see that maybe the RNN is doing something more. Okay. So you're saying in particular, it's even better than the multitask one, which yeah. is just learning everything uh, constantly. Um, no, so here, uh, sorry, here everything is continual learning. Okay, so, okay, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
Oh yeah, that would be really, really surprising if I was always getting a. But but the, I'm this, still surprised. I'm still surprised. Yeah. Just not quite as surprised. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But this brings me to the next slide, where actually this three RL baseline can do as good as its multitask soft upper bound. Okay, okay. cool. So yeah, so it's not uh, beating it, but at least it's doing as good. Uh, so here in the dotted lines, you see the analog versions of the baseline in the multitask regime. And now for me, that was super surprising because that's like, that's the first thing you hear in continual learning. Like you get into continual learning because you're excited about forward transfer and blah, blah, blah. But then everyone tells you, oh no, focus on catastrophic forgetting. It, it's, it's the problem. So um, I was kind of super surprised when I saw this. It, it so, is a little different in the reinforcement learning scenario. Yeah. Though. In, the, in the supervised learning, like every sample can be from a different task. And so in the, you know, in the, in the non-continued learning scenario, every sample can be from a different task. And so it's seeing everything. In the continual learning scenario, you still have to stay within a task for a little while. And, and you know, there's still potentially some task interference uh, going on. Um, I mean, there's a lot of task in interference in this benchmark as well. Yeah, uh, that's what I mean. It, that's what I mean, oh, exactly. Okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. Oh yeah, so then you're totally right. There's yeah, there, yeah. exactly, there's an, there could be an advantage to learning in a non-stationary matter. It, it could reduce. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. Okay, so basically, the rest of the presentation is uh, testing out some hypothesis that could explain uh, this behavior uh, and the previous one. Okay, um, so we're, I, I'm kind of like I'll start with the simplest hypothesis, which I'll try to uh, invalidate. So the first one that could explain why the at least why the RNN is always better than the task uh, agnostic and task aware baseline is that simply having an RNN um, in RL or at least in this setting improves a uh, single task performance. Okay, it's a, it's a good inductive bias to have an RNN uh, when you're doing, you're learning an NDP. Uh, so what we did uh, is we uh, trained um, an agent with and without an RNN in the single task regime. So basically before we were doing 10 or 20 tasks, now we're in continually. Now we're doing them independently. And um, it turns out that adding a, an RNN was not improving the performance. It was even hurting. So uh, we're kind of invalidating the hypothesis that the RNN is just better at RL. Okay, something else is happening. Um, hypothesis number two, okay? So if you're knowledgeable of continual learning, uh, I guess you understand that um, the, 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 what we need to manage in, in continual learning is this balance between plasticity and stability. So in other words, uh, standard neural nets are too plastic, so they tend to forget. So we try to increase the stability of our models. Uh, so a lot of um, a successful continual learning strategy, they will increase the parameter stability uh, either in a soft way. So maybe like a EWC uh, keeps you from moving the, the parameters too much, or you can also, also do this in a hard way, like maybe PacNet that's going to completely freeze parts of the net. Um, so yeah, you can successful continual learning methods uh, increase parameter stability. So maybe uh, the RNN somehow increases the stability of the parameters. So we tested this hypothesis. And basically what we did is we reported um, how much the parameters are moving through an epoch of learning. And somehow um, all of the methods uh, as training, so there's a dip at first in the movement of the parameters. And then somehow it just constantly increases throughout the training. Uh, and that's even true for the multitask method uh, in, um, in the dotted lines here. So um, 
yeah, this invalidates the, the hypothesis that the RNN increases parameter stability. Uh, Could you just explain in a little bit more detail what is on the y-axis here? Yeah. Is this uh, gradients or parameters or or what? Yeah. So okay. So it. I didn't want to. I wanted to take the effect of Adam out of um, this analysis. So basically, what I'm doing is I'm accumulating. Um, the I'm looking at all of the gradients I'm getting through an epoch, and then I'm computing how much uh, each parameter would have uh, moved given those gradients. And then once I have uh, the distribution of how each parameters would have moved, I compute uh, the entropy of that uh, vector, basically. So, uh, so you sum the total change parameter wise and the entropy is calculated across parameters not across steps is that right Ex yeah exactly 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 so if okay. all my parameters are moving around equally i'll get a, a uniform distribution with which has the highest entropy and vice versa Great. so with with something like ewc or synaptic intelligence you would expect it to sort of gradually decrease keep decrecing yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Do you know well, if that's known? Is, have you tried that or? Gradually, I don't know, but at least in PacNet, you would definitely see. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But in, um, for EWC, I don't know. I, I, I think I, well, definitely for SI, I think you would see this. Um, um, SI, after a while, will kind of saturate with the number of tasks. It doesn't scale too well yeah. with the number of tasks anyway. Yeah, I guess that makes sense because you, you, you cannot, you're accumulating these uh, like Fisher matrix that tell you which parameter not to touch. Exactly. So I guess, yeah. yeah, yeah. So it makes sense. Yeah, and as you learn more tasks, you, it's there's the room to change it becomes lower and lower. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. So in this case, this is in the RNN case or the other methods here. It's definitely not the case. The parameters are moving around more and more, which is kind of interesting. Um, so this leads us to the last hypothesis, the hypothesis uh, that I like the most, uh, which is that the RNN correctly places the new task in the context of the previous task. Okay, so um, I think the simplest way to explain this is with a, a simple uh, example. Uh, let's say so. Uh, you know, in this paper, we're doing manipulation tasks. So the Task one could be uh, reaching a doorknob, whereas uh, task two could be open a door, okay? So if the RNN understands uh, well, the, if the RNN learns a proper um, task representation or a proper representation of each uh, time step in its world, maybe while it's learning the second task, through the tra trajectories of observations and rewards, it would understand that it's in the in the context. So if you want to open a door, you need to first reach the door, which is task zero. So maybe the RNN, while it's trying to reach a door, understands that uh, the first part is just using the policy learned on the first task. And then somehow it can learn this new task of uh, opening a door faster because it just uses um, the first the first learn policy uh, correctly, you know. Um, yeah, this this make yeah this is a nice idea. It, I may have missed this. I'm not super clear how the what is the network architecture and how does the RNN relate? I mean, typically yeah. Meta World, I think is just an MLP. Yeah. But uh, well, how does the RNN interact and? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, yeah. So I guess it's just, yeah, maybe I should be more clear about that, but uh, it's kind of simple. The RNN takes in uh, the previous trajectory up to time step T, for example, and then it's going to encode it, encode it in uh, ZT. So that's like its output, the output of the RNN. And then we're just going to feed this to the classic MLP. Uh, the classic, uh, uh, so we're going to feed this to the actor, which is an MLP, and feed this to 
the critics, which are also MLPs. Okay. So you just append the input vector with this output in addition to the opposite. The, the exactly. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So it's super okay. simple. And then you just train this end to end uh, without even changing the last function. Okay, got it. Yeah, so it's a really simple uh, baseline. Great. So maybe the RNN recontextualizes the new task in the in the previous one correctly. So it's hard to test for that hypothesis directly, but maybe there's some things we can, there's some effects of that hypothesis that we could observe if it's true, okay? So one would be um, that if this, is, if this is true, the RNN could potentially learn faster than the other methods. So the first thing we're gonna do is like, it's gonna, so we're gonna look at the current performance of the method, okay? Before we were looking I didn't say so, but we were looking at the global performance of the method on all tasks. But here we're looking at their current performance. So this is why we're seeing these spikes. Um, and then if you zoom in on, so here we have like uh, the methods that are doing continual learning. Uh, these ones will struggle on a lot of tasks. So I don't know, it's kind of not super clear, but they will only learn task zero, oh, task zero, two, five, and then eight. And then we have like these independent methods. Those are like always trained from scratch. And these are a bit, sometimes they can learn a bit more. Um, but anyway, that's not super important. What I wanna zoom in is uh, the top part of the performance graph. And here you can see, that 3RL uh, not only learns faster than all of the previous, uh, all of the other continual learning methods, it also learns faster than the model trains from scratch. So there is definitely some uh, weight to the hypothesis that um, the RNN is kind of reusing the past to learn faster uh, here, I think at least. So, um, not sure if that was super clear, but that's kind of like the first observation uh, we can use if we want to put some weight on this hypothesis. Have you looked at the embeddings of the RNN to see if there's some similarity with similar mm -hmm. tasks or? Yeah, um, so my last slide is actually the related representations of the task. It's just, it's really, really hard to quantify. Yeah, yeah it's... Uh, <laughs> Meta world is awesome, but it's uh, it's so convoluted the reward functions that it's hard to quantify all tasks relate to each other. Like you know, they all share a common structure, but yeah, pinpointing yeah. it is hard. Um, okay, so that's observation number one. Um, the second one is okay. Let's go back. Let's have a new running example now. Uh, let's say task zero is, or task one is to push a pencil and task two is to pull a pencil, okay? So um, for both tasks, reaching the pencil is, is, the, we're gonna, is the same policy. But when you get to the pencil, now one task is, is gonna tell you to go forward, the other is gonna tell you to go backwards. So you're gonna get conflicting gradients, right? Uh, as you mentioned earlier there, I guess it's what you call the task inference, uh, Subutai. Uh, but I, so in green meta, in multitask reinforced meta learning, we talk about a gradient conflict and how it can be reduced. So um, if you're task aware, so if you know that you need to push something or pull something, then it's fine. You shouldn't get much uh, gradient conflict. Um, but if the RNN uh, correctly places the new task, the new task in the context of previous one, then we can expect, we might expect that uh, the gradient conflict is reduced. Okay. Um, so my, the next observation, what we're doing is uh, we're running, we're looking at the variance um, in the mini batch as a proxy for gradient conflict um, 
a lot of previous work, instead of looking at the variance of the gradient, they look at the, the angle between the gradients. Uh, I think that's a I think that's not as good as looking at the uh, create the variance of the gradient. Uh, I have an argument for that. We can discuss uh, if you want. But for now, uh, assume that like x axis measures uh, gradient conflict, and y axis measures uh, you know the performance of the agent. And as you can see, um, not only is the three RL not only does it enjoy more agreement in its gradient than um, the baseline that is task agnostic. So, you know, just running the RL algorithm on all tasks uh, without task IDs. Not only is, is there more agreement in its gradient, there's also more agreement than in the multi-head case, okay? Um, so I think this, again, uh, put some weight on the hypothesis that uh, this RNN is just great and it can, um, you know, correctly place new tasks in the context of others. And here also, um, the size of the bubble represents how stable the training is, which is uh, approximated by how much your Q value is changing throughout your training. And we, it's actually in log, log space. And we can actually, even in log log space, we can see that uh, the RNN enjoys much more stable training than the other guys. So uh, yeah, I think that's some proof that uh, hypothesis three is true. And then uh, I don't know for I don't know if it uh, if it counts for much, but some uh, qualitative support for the uh, hypothesis. Um, so now, so here we're looking at the representation that the RNN is learning throughout its life. Okay. Um, so basically I'm focusing on four tasks and, uh, what you can see at the bottom is like PCA representation of an episode in each task. Okay. So, um, there's a couple of things I want to point out here. Uh, so this is before training, this is after one task, and this is at the end, okay? So before training, the initialization is uh, the kind of, for each task, it's not in the same part of the space. So that's, uh, that's a problem, right? Because in this setting, uh, the benchmark is task agnostic. So there's no way to know in which task you are at the beginning of the uh, training. Uh, at the, at, if you only condition on the first state, there's no way to know which task you're in. Um, so this, this, its representation are not invariant to the randomness in the first state. So that's one thing. Just a question for clarification. In, in which space do you do the PCA? Oh yeah, so this is the, in the space of Z. So the, Z, the okay. representation, yeah, 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 yeah. sorry. Okay. Um, and and, and how, then, what is the dimensionality of C? Um, what is the dimensionality of C? I think it's like 30 or something, but I okay. can't remember. Yeah, something like that. Mm, thanks. Um, yeah, so initialization are not invariant to the initial state. And then um, the episodes or like the representation quickly collapses to a certain point, right? It's not learning like rich representations of the episodes. And then as training unfolds, uh, a couple of things are happening. The initializations are getting closer and closer, which makes sense because you're not supposed to be able to infer the task from the initial randomness. You wanna learn an invariant initial representation. And two, now the representations are like constantly evolving throughout the episode. And, you know, they're also intersecting in interesting ways, like at different stages of uh, the episodes of each task. So, you know, it's only qualitative, but this is kind of aligned with the hypothesis that, uh, you know, the um, the RNN is doing more than just task inference. It's decomposing each task 
and it's kind of overlapping them uh, when necessary. Um, yeah, so that's um, that for the qualitative analysis. And um, yeah, mostly done. I guess uh, the, the the discussion part of the presentation is first uh, implications for continual learning research. So at least for me, this idea of like dropping in the world autonomous learning agents that can continually learn. Uh, that was my main motivation. So for me, for me at least, it's unclear if uh, I should be working on catastrophic forgetting or task inference uh, anymore. Uh, maybe it's now time to focus on forward transfer uh, if this uh, use case is uh, in your motivation. And um, yeah, the, it, like it's also interesting to discuss like why is this not happening in continual supervised learning like what's fundamentally different in um, continual reinforcement learning versus continual supervised learning uh, one thing i can see that the most um, obvious is that in continual reinforcement learning or at least the way we study it uh, the action space or the prediction space of the agent, it's always fixed. It's not like, it's not increasing at each task, uh, contrarily to continual supervised learning or, you know, incremental classification, where at each task, I'm just increasing uh, my output space and only operating in these new actions or new predictions. Um, now, why am I saying this? Well, um, if you keep increasing your, uh, your action space with, for example, new classes, uh, then, and if you also apply a softmax, then if you're not doing replay you, or if, you, if you're not smart about it, your softmax will be badly calibrated and um, you, what we call forgetting might just be, or a part of it could be explained by a badly calibrated uh, output head because of this increasing, in, increasing output space with the softmax. Uh, so that could be one difference between uh, continual reinforcement learning and continual supervised learning. And uh, also I think there's this idea of like, in continual reinforcement learning, the, or at least in the scenarios we studied today, um, you know that the tasks we kind of know how they relate to each other, so we kind of know that um, some forward transfer is achievable, um, which is not always super clear in uh, incremental image classification. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of how I. Uh, like to uh, finish the presentation. Yeah, um, I, I think there's some truth to that too. Um, you know, it's continuous super, supervised learning. How you do the head really makes a big difference. Yeah, how you set up sure. the head. It's not necessarily fundamental, and and we've uh, seen that in our our work as well. Um, and and when in our most recent paper, we were actually surprised. So we did permuted MNIST, and we kept mm -hmm. the head fixed. So it's always ten classes. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just that the task is changing. Yep. Um, and we got a lot less catastrophic forgetting than we expected with the standard MLP. Um, exactly. Yeah, yeah, was, yeah. 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 I think it actually it would make more sense to study, like if you, we want to stay in continual supervised learning, what you referred yeah. to, I think it's called domain incremental learning. Exactly. It, yeah, yeah. It makes more sense and uh, you can actually understand better. With, like you, now you're forgetting is the forgetting in the representation. And I think that's what's important. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I like the idea of focusing, I mean, the community should focus more on forward transfer and I mean, permitted MNIST, going back to your earlier comments on benchmarks, permitted MNIST is not, a, it's a terrible benchmark for that because <laughs> every yeah. task is completely randomly different. Yeah, 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 no, I uh, agree that it's just there to show us that uh, there's catastrophic <laughs> forgetting. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, no, I agree. I, I'm curious to hear what scenarios are you doing uh, these days? Uh, um, so I don't know if you saw our most recent uh, paper we were doing, we actually, 
um, we were looking at both multitask reinforcement learning and continued learning with trying to approach that with the same architecture. And okay. in our case, we're you nice. know, we're very biologically motivated, and so in the we we um, incorporated something called dendrites uh, yep. from neuroscience. So the dendrites do a task specific modulation of the network and creates these sparse sub networks based on yep. the task. And so we applied it to both NTRL and continual learning. We did not do continual RL, which would be quite interesting. Yeah. Um, the other thing in our NTRL is the task ID was known, and but it was static. Whereas mm -hmm. in, it was very interesting to look at your RNN representations because the, if I think of that as kind of a task embedding, it, it was changing for even for a given task as you showed. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah which yeah, is yeah. very important, I think, and which happens in biology too. Um, yeah. And that's something mm -hmm. we did not do. Okay, nice. So the paper you're talking about is that the doubly double sparsity something something? No, no. It's uh, it's okay. called uh, avoiding catastrophe active dendrites. Ah, I see. Um, in, I, I can send you the link after. Okay, yeah, thank you. Because uh, yeah. the the double double sparsity one is on my reading list. I need to check this okay. one out. There. Yeah, yeah. I'm also. Yeah, that I, one's looking at that. That one's not focused on continuous learning. That's just focused on speed improvements. Um, yeah. Although we yeah, did yeah. have dual sparsity in the continued learning one, we didn't really emphasize it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Maybe I'll just read this, the other one then. Okay. Cool. Um, but it would be natural to do continual RL in, as an extension of our paper there. So it'd be super interesting to, to listen to yeah. this. Yeah. Uh, well, that's actually how it, this project started. I was trying yeah. to do some kind of continual sparse reinforced learning method. Um, I mean, I, I, in my mind, I use the word modularity, but I think they're kind of the same. Uh, and then it was just so hard to beat that RNN baseline. Yeah. Uh, we <laughs> well, so I have a question that. about, yes, yeah, so I have a question about that. <laughs> so you talked about what is a good benchmark. And I think, yeah. you know, it seemed like you're really proposing a benchmark, but then this RNN method, your baseline does really well. Mm. Um, and I think another property of a good benchmark is that there's still room to improve and other people can take that benchmark and try to beat yeah. the baselines and improve. So do you think it's your benchmark is solved or is there significant room for improvement still over, yeah. about, over the RNN? Mm, okay, so first it's, it's not my benchmark. Um, so uh, continual world is like uh, another paper. Okay. Um, and I guess, in our in my case i just made it task agnostic mm -hmm. and um it's definitely not solved like it, it's really really hard so if you just look here um so you know there's here there's 10 tasks and uh given 1 million time step per task um you know the the, the continual learners they're only successfully learning four tasks, and then they'll forget some of them, mm. except the RNN, which is able to not forget in this case. Uh, but no, it's super hard. There's a, it's like, if you want to hold on to a benchmark for a while, you'll, you'll be fine in continual world, uh, that's for sure. But do you think there's significant room for improvement over the three RL? Oh yeah, for baseline. sure, because because it's, it's still, uh, so, okay, uh, let me see. RL. Yeah, the global um, success is 0.5, right? That means a lot of improvement is possible. Yeah, exactly. So, so even in multitask learning, like, yeah, um, yeah. oh, I don't have the reference. I think it's in the previous slide. Okay, so if you train all of the method independently with one million step per task, which is like the same compute you're allowed for the, in continual learning and meta learning, uh, you'll reach this performance. So um, okay, okay. There's still a lot of room just just to just to get to the model that has absolutely no transfer between tasks because it's just learning one model per task independently. Mm -hmm. But I think as we you know once we reach this one, we have to beat it right because <laughs> like yeah. continual learning <laughs> makes sense if uh, we can yeah get transfer between tasks and so on and so on. Um, so and I guess uh, there's also the speed of learning. Uh, could be faster. Yeah, it's another metric. Yeah, one hundred percent. So in the in the paper, uh, or at least in 
the benchmark, they prescribe one million steps per task, uh, but it would be like, I, you know, some, um, okay, so there's a couple of things I want to say. So, yeah, so definitely more compute would help. So like, like uh, the independent model, let's take uh, the uh, purple guy. Like here, it's starting to learn. Here, it's starting to learn, but it it doesn't have enough compute to uh, learn all tasks. But um, so to give you an example, like now I'm running 10 million time steps, but the meta world guys are to to, to learn all tasks. They're like running 100 or 200 or 500 million time steps. Okay, so it's like we're operating in a really really data and compute constrained regime compared to them. Um, so the tasks are learnable, but there's a lot room, there's a lot of improvement on the data efficiency side. Mm -hmm. And then what I also want to point out is like, um, there is, you're losing a lot, like sometimes the initialization you're getting from these continual learning models is actually hurting you in learning the new task. So that's kind of like, something I think we should try fixing, right? It really sucks. You're not, you're rarely seeing this in continual supervised learning, I think. Um, but yeah, has, as the benchmarks are get harder, uh, I think, so if you instantiate them in reinforcement learning, uh, I think that you'll get this problem, which we should try to fix, I think. Um, another thing that is mm. interesting. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks a lot, Massimo. Uh, normally, we wrap up after about an hour. So I just want to kind of point out anyone's free to take off at this point. But um, yeah. I'm happy to hang around for a few extra minutes to discuss a little bit more if people have questions. Uh, yeah, th thanks, Massimo. This was a very nice presentation. Yeah, thank I, you. I have one, one last question, maybe. Yeah, sure. <laughs> On the, um, but we show this this 2D plots on the on the C space with the PCA. Mm -hmm. um, given it's a 2D projection of a very high dimensional space, it can be sometimes misleading. Yeah. Uh, did, did you try to look like a, a like pairwise yeah. distances between those points? That might be interesting. Uh, pairwise distances. Well, I I've looked at a three dimensional uh, mm -hmm. representation, um, but the I think the first two observations were explaining uh, like around 70% of the variance. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I think most of what's happening, uh, what, yeah, most of the interesting stuff can be seen in uh, those two first dimensions. But um, yeah, I guess with the pairwise distances, you could understand really what's happening under the hood. It's just that Without a notion of task similarity, uh, it's like I, I'm not sure what I would do with that data. Um, yeah. Like if if I knew that task one was zero zero point three close to task two and and so on and so on, maybe I could do some I could run some statistics. But uh, without that, it's hard. I think. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, it was really interesting to me in that chart that the RNN representations were changing quite a bit for a mm -hmm. given task. Yeah, that, that yeah. I think there's a lot of unexplored. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like yeah, I only scratched the surface and now I, I need yeah. to work on something else, but uh, <laughs> I wish I could dig into it more. Yeah. So that's always the sign of a good research project. There's more, <laughs> always more behind it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, one thing that was kind of interesting to me about your method is that there are other methods that try and explicitly facilitate forward transfer or even mm -hmm. backward transfer from current tasks back to previous ones by mixing and matching the outputs of different classification heads or things yep. like that. And your method is kind of interesting in that it um, it's sort of less explicit in how it does that. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. I guess, do you have any ideas about how kind of letting the network figure out how to mix and match things versus trying to facilitate mixing and matching is maybe useful versus not useful? 
Yeah, well, I know that's so, a very open-ended question. Yeah, but I'm curious to hear. No, your no, thoughts. it's a good question. So, yeah, so maybe I can tell you a bit about the method that I was trying to develop, and that somehow it was never beating the RNN. Uh, but I think I know why. Um, but essentially, what I was trying to do is learn these masks uh, on top of the weights. Um, so per task mask to do multitasking. Um, so this is kind of like uh, a trick that is a uh, really used right now in continual learning literature. Um, but then I wanted in the task agnostic setting, I wanted the RNN to output the mask uh, that I was applying on the actor and critic. Okay, so I was hoping that the RNN would infer the task and somehow segment uh, into different parts uh, the actor and critic so that they can perform multitask learning. Uh, but somehow this was never better than just feeding the RNN representation to the actor and critic. Mm. Um, so, 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 so I'm not sure how that answers your question, uh, but. Uh, yeah, that that that's. I think there's there's there would a there would be a way to make this um, thing work, um, but uh, I haven't managed to yet. Well, yeah, it's. Um, I don't know what kind of answer I would expect from that question because it's like I said, it's really open ended, but that still provides a lot of insight into. Um, Kind of how the project evolved and, and mm -hmm. what you're thinking is that it's pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Maybe I should put a note in the appendix. Like, here's how we got <laughs> to the talking about the baseline. Yeah. You think this is still a good um, benchmark for testing out forward transfer? Oh yeah. It, it, so it, mm -hmm. it's actually created for that. Uh, mm -hmm. So if you go to the continual world paper. Uh, like it's mostly about forward transfer and um, they have reference reference point for like how much forward transfer you should expect. And um, in mm -hmm. my case, because we were task agnostic and always doing replay, uh, we were not getting as much uh, forward transfer as you could get with the like, um, well calibrated packnet, uh, which is like the method that works the best, at least for them in the task aware setting. But uh, yeah, the focus of this benchmark is a lot on forward transfer. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Did you look at backward transfer at all? It seems like your method might also facilitate backward transfer. Yeah, so if by backward transfer, you mean like a if negative transfer, if negative backward transfer is forgetting, um, yeah, triar the, the baseline right. was getting right. uh, was able to remember everything uh, when the scene was success successful, because like a lot of variance in this benchmark comes from like something going wrong at some point, and then um, your performance on all the tasks might go down. Uh, but yeah, when everything was going correctly. The RNN was able to remember everything, and which was not the case for all baselines. Yeah. No, no, no. Okay. But yeah, so it basically I, mitigates negative backward transfer, mitigates catastrophic <laughs> forgetting. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I guess yeah. You, you did compare it to the multitask uh, setting or just training on one task at a time and saw some similar results. So I guess actually maybe it's pretty hard to beat that baseline of just training on like one task at a time. And then, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it, it sucks that we're not reaching that, uh, that performance, but uh, I, I, I think it's just a matter, a matter of time. And um, yeah, maybe just a matter of time. Yeah, yeah good. I guess it's, it's, it's like, um, it, if you train one model per task, then somehow you end up with, you know, one model per task. So it's, it's kind of not really, well, it's not, not manageable. Um, yeah, I don't know where I'm going with this. 
but um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's it. Yeah, you mentioned the high variance. That's something we ran into as a problem as well with this with this setup. Is uh, such yeah. high such high variance? It's uh, you know, of course, you have to run lots of simulate lots of experiments. Each experiment is very time consuming, as you mentioned. Yeah, um, but then it's really hard to draw conclusions about what's significant and what's not from a statistical yeah 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 100% um, yeah, yeah that's the uh, sad part about uh, those experiments um yeah. so uh, yeah the, in the paper we've run eight seeds mm -hmm. um for each data for each method configuration but uh, ideally it would be even more but uh, then you cannot run as much experiments. So, you know, there's always this yeah. uh, trade-off. Yeah, 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 yeah.